extremely aware of perception, how our work will be viewed, and hopefully, ultimately, the impact it has on our viewers, our audience. But we so rarely flip that perspective and consider how those perceptions will impact us. And it is those perceptions that my doppelganger was born from. Uh, she was Frankenstein together and fed by every print, poster, and illustration I've done. Uh, this past January, the other Ching forged herself on my work with the Women's March. Um, I had the honor of being selected as one of eight uh, local female uh, artists to help create artwork for the return of the Women's March to DC. I spent two weeks designing and painting original artworks, um, scores of them, in fact, um, to represent thousands of protesters. Now, regardless of how you might feel about the Women's March, many, if not all of you, know of it. And the recognizability of this event, and for many people, its meaningfulness, you know, being hired on for a job like that was not lost on me. If anything, it had me questioning whether or not I belonged in a job like that. If I had enough knowledge of the issues, if I had the requisite skill set, if I had the right personality as a person, as an artist, because again, usually I'm a solo act, and all of a sudden I was working with this crew of truly amazing individuals, but it was a lot of collaboration. But as I got to know my fellow artists, I found we all echoed similar concerns. How would we contribute meaningfully to a project like this? I would hear my own worries coming from their mouths, and my response was always a remark of incredulity. We never questioned the rightness of the other artists we only question our own. And I think that those questions and worries arose because it was so easy to feel small. Not just because of the huge reputation that this event had, but also just the sheer breadth and scale of the works we were creating. In the warehouse we were working in, we were dwarfed by these signs and banners and sculptures we were creating, but once they were out there in the world, bobbing amidst a sea of women and their allies, they were just the right size. And in the end, as a team, <coughs> so are we. Now, I probably shouldn't have been all that surprised that I was involved with the Women's March this year because 2018 turned out to be a year full of political work. Just this past summer, I was commissioned to create a poster for a series of protests. But uh, to be honest with you all, the original commission was maybe one step left of spec work, which is something I avoid as a general rule. But that is a rule I will bend when it comes to causes I believe in. And for me, this cause is important. So I spent a few hours one night 
putting together this poster, and I sent it on its way, fully expecting it to eventually fade into the background until it seemed like it had never existed at all. But after a couple of weeks, the creative director for that project started sending me stories. Stories that covered the protests against Brett Kavanaugh's Supreme Court nomination. And my Kavanaugh poster was front and center. <laughs> the number of links grew, and photos started popping up of scenes <coughs> from all over the US. And they were on the internet, it was on television, it was in publication. And before I knew it, news outlets in other countries were using photos featuring my poster. And up until that summer, my work had generally been politically neutral. I had no interest in alienating friends, family, and of course fans. And as a female artist with a young family in this climate, I wanted to tread carefully. So I did not put my name on this poster. I did not publicly claim ownership of it. But uh, nonetheless, I was identified. Now, I'm someone who really enjoys being left alone. <laughs> I, I used to joke in undergrad that I was an aspiring hermit. I thought I would do a great job. And to be honest, my career now is just a money-making version of that. I often sit alone in my dark office in disheveled leisure wear, um, <laughs> toiling away at whatever's on my docket. Um, my interactions with most people are via email, punctuated occasionally by video chat or a phone call or ugh, an in-person meeting. <laughs> um, but um, normally when it comes to my work, it's just my name that's attached. And, and that's what it is. It's just a name. But this time, that is not how it worked out. Once identified media requests, started coming in, and <clears throat> reviews were being written by the likes of Art.net and Forbes. Um, reviewing the work and interpreting my choices behind this or that without any kind of internal input or context as to how that poster came to be. And <laughs> I am very uncomfortable with that. <laughs> um, but in addition to these media requests that were incoming, I received a lot of other messages. And luckily, all of them were positive. They were from people um, who had had some kind of interaction with my poster that wanted to contact me and tell me how it had made them feel in this moment. And it really floored me that something done so quickly in a matter of two hours had turned into this symbol to thousands of people a visual thread for a moment in history, and that other Tracy Ching had been inextricably linked to it. Um, I even found out later the Library of Congress requested official copies to be added to their collection. And just that past spring, I had been included, included in a different collection, although luckily for me, this was just in name this time around. Um, this imposing structure is the Design Museum in London, it is one of the world's most leading design museums and hosts millions of visitors and millions of followers. Um, the exhibition, Hope to Nope, Graphics and Politics from 2008 to 2018, ran from March until August of this past year. It included works by juggernauts like Milton Glaser and Shepard Ferry and also included my cover for Politico that hung next to some of the most <coughs> iconic Trump covers from the last few years. I had designed the Politico, RNC, and DNC covers in the summer of 2016, when Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton were still just presumptive nominees. I had no idea what would happen, what it would mean for our nation, or that one of those covers would be seen significant enough to include it in an exhibition about the connection between politics and graphics. I thought it was just gonna be some boring magazine cover. Now, that's not to throw any shade at you editorial creative directors out there. <laughs> I geek out at publications 
just like anybody else. Um, during my undergrad, one of my jobs actually was photographing and researching vintage film and publications, which included Life, Time, Newsweek, and all of those hours spent working with these publications dating as far back as the 1930s taught me to have a very special and healthy respect for publications and their place in history. So you can imagine how it blew my mind to have the opportunity to design a domestic and international cover for Newsweek. After this issue was distributed, I went looking for it on newsstands, um, wondering if in 80 years some other undergrad somewhere would be photographing my cover. And it was this really surreal moment, and for me it felt like this major career milestone, but very few people that follow me come for the political or editorial work, but really puts the butts in the seats is the posters. And so as impressive as Newsweek may have been, the reaction was like lukewarm at best, uh, especially when compared to the gig poster I released a few months later. Now, I will concede that the Metallica community and the people who collect their memorabilia is, is in many ways significantly more hardcore than those for Newsweek. <laughs> New Jersey, Metallica was always playing somewhere in the background. Um, and I began to worry about getting this right. You know, they are in many ways their own American institution, and this was only my third gig poster and my first major band designing four. You know, were metalheads going to show up with torches and pitchforks if I didn't get it right? It wasn't metal enough? Um, so I was a little nervous. Um, but fear has always been a really great motivator for me. And so fear of not doing my best, it keeps me engaged. It keeps me honest and critical of my choices where I might have otherwise been more inclined to take some shortcuts. And it convinces me to step up to the plate and swing for the fences, and luckily for me, there were no riots over this poster. Um, in fact, it was a really positive experience. There are very few prints I look back on and I like. You know, some posters come together in a matter of days, and there are posters like this one that take weeks. And all of those hours logged, I become sick of the image, or I totally lose the ability to tell if it's good anymore. So I hope you'll appreciate what it means for me to be able to look at this and go, yeah, that one was good. <laughs> <laughs> and I liked it so much, in fact, it influenced several other prints afterward. Um, I've always been a fan of uh, double-sided lighting, two-tone lighting, um, but I really got hooked the first time uh, doing a screening print for Blade Runner. I chose the reference image um, from the film itself because of that twin light source, and that subtle dual coloring influenced the entire print. And it is actually probably one of the most popular prints I've ever done. So when 2049 came out, I was really excited after seeing how hard they went on the two-tone lighting, because that means I could create a set. So it was a really exciting exercise to see how far I'd come as an illustrator in those three years, to see what boundaries I could push. Um, when I had worked on Metallica, I had entirely fabricated the lighting in that poster. And so that gave me a little bit more courage um, to maybe take risks where I had otherwise been more reserved, uh, specifically where likeness is involved, because guys, faces are hard. <laughs> and you know, the lighting isn't realistic, and it's a little off on Kay's face. Um, and this is a lot louder than the original Blade Runner, um, and maybe a little less balanced. But I overall really enjoy the, the end product. And apparently, so did other people. 
Um, most of my poster work is done in limited edition silkscreen print, some of which you guys saw um, outside a little bit earlier. Um, 2049 was my largest and most successful print movie poster run of 2018, second only overall to Metallica. Now I do tend to get ahead of myself a little bit and forget that not everybody knows about this niche community I work in. Um, over the last 15 years or so, there's been this kind of renaissance um, around movie posters. Um, I think the when I got started, it was really about silk screen alternative movie posters. And the first player really to come into the game was Mondo. And when they got started, they weren't even Mondo at that point. They were, in fact, the Alamo Draft House in Austin. Um, but thanks to them and other players, the field has grown to the point that studios now are commissioning alternative movie posters for their titles. Um, this is the most recent uh, license poster I've done, uh, revealed just this past Tuesday, so I could share it with you guys. Otherwise, I would have been subject to a gag order um, for Captain Marvel. Releasing March 8th. Um, at the start of the project, I was unsure if I should take part. Now, the, because the original commission stipulated to avoid likeness, and that's kind of my jam, so I was unsure if this job was right for me. When I expressed that concern, they said, you know, submit something anyway, just try to sidestep likeness where you can. You know, try to turn her face or, you know, mask it somewhat with the binary aura. So um, I struggled to find something I liked, but in the end, I submitted these two here on the left. Um, approvals came back for the first concept, this one here, but after a couple of days, I got a note saying that it looked too much like some of the other artwork that they had commissioned, and they wanted to go with the second concept, but they wanted to add her, her helmet and have the mohawk. Um, and so at this point in time, the second work in progress concept was due, but I had to submit another concept for reapproval, and then I still had that truncated amount of time. So again, I'm questioning whether or not I'm right for this job, but I was told that pulling out at that point would look bad. Um, <laughs> so I submitted the concept over here, so you see on the side, and that was the one that eventually got approved. And I took a deep dive into her suit for about like two weeks. Um, and in the end, I was happy I stuck with it. Um, I was floored by the, the sheer mountain of responses I got. Again, luckily most of them positive. Um, but nothing trumps this message, um, or messages like this I received. Um, Captain Marvel is the first female-led um, superhero film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And for those not following, there's been a lot of controversy around Marvel being a woman and a few other things surrounding the film. Um, and despite me knowing all of this, uh, my perspective failed to allow me to recognize that my involvement as a female movie poster artist in a male-dominated field, in a typically male-subscribed genre, um, would matter to more people than just me. And so I don't know if I would have had this opportunity to connect to provide an image for women and girls, possibly, if I hadn't done um, this poster uh, for Thor Ragnarok, uh, another officially licensed poster through Marvel and Disney. Uh, this was actually uh, released by Fandango. If you bought an advance ticket for the film, you could pay shipping and handling, and they'd send you a digital lithograph. Um, not a shiny one. Like seen here, I was actually allowed to print a limited edition run of silkscreen foil prints, and that was, so Blade Runner was like my most successful one in 2016, this was the most successful one for 2017. Um, and so the company is attached to this job really, really big, and the marketing campaign for the giveaway was really wide. And even to this day, the interest in this print is still really high. But would you believe me if I told you if I designed this major motion picture, movie poster in three days? <laughs> I, I really wouldn't fault you um, if you didn't believe me because 
to be honest, my entire career as a designer and illustrator has, at least for me, in general, been unbelievable. I went from unemployed with a fine art degree to a full-time freelance designer in under five years. In that time, I landed representation at two galleries within the US and an international design agency. In the last 10 months, I helped steer the visuals for one of the largest reoccurring marches in the United States, someone whose message I've really cared about and followed since that first march. I created a viral poster for one of the most contentious Supreme Court nominations in recent memory, only to have it reviewed and compared to the artwork of Shepard Fairey, someone whom I've idolized and aspired to be like since I was young, which was a long time ago, kind of. Um, and that poster made it into the Library of Congress. And another one of my works made it into one of the leading design museums in the world. I designed covers for Newsweek, whose covers I photographed and researched and sent to other people from a sweltering warehouse 10 years prior. I illustrated a poster for a legendary band whose music was a fixture in my youth. And despite my doubts, it turned out to be one of my most successful runs of 2018. I've made my way as one of few female illustrators creating official movie posters. And just this year, I launched um, a mentorship and grant program for emerging female artists, all while caring for my three young children. It's all crazy. <laughs> um, after making the mad decision to become a freelance designer nine years ago, um, I've made sure that at the end of every year, I reflect on the experiences and um, successes, achievements. And this year when I looked back, the image of Tracy 2009 versus Tracy in 2019 looked nothing alike. Um, and it wasn't just my sleep-deprived brain. Um, the things that separate them seemed really big. And this year was just a little bit too much um, because the truth is, I am just some kid who grew up in New Jersey, never knowing where they stood. You know, I knew I liked movies and art and playing sports, but one community, one mold never really fit. And so no one questioned that I would get into art, but I assumed that I would graduate and end up a 60-year-old waitress working at a diner by the shore doing her artsy hobbies on the weekend. You know, I, I graduated with my BFA and was immediately unemployed to the surprise of no one. <laughs> and so I decided to take a leap and pursue a career in design. And every job, every opportunity that came my way was met with gratitude and enthusiasm. And that turned into years of 18 hour work days, no weekends, no holidays, no vacations. And after all of that ludicrous hard work and hustle and dedication, never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd be flown out, all expenses paid to different cities, to different countries, because of my work. Never would I have thought that Adobe, a company whose programs literally make my job possible, would give me a gorgeous piece of equipment just so I could test and give feedback on their mobile app. Jim and I coming out this fall. <laughs> <laughs> I never would have believed that reps from companies like Lionsgate or Hasbro, companies I'd idolized for a long, long time, would treat me with kid gloves because they were afraid they would bruise my ego. <laughs> never did I think that old and new friends alike would begin to call me famous, Mm -hmm. and treat me differently because of who they thought I'd become. I don't know about any of that. From my perspective, I'm still just that kid from New Jersey. <laughs> but there's this other me. There's this Tracy Ching out there that people see and interpret, and she means something else to them and they expect her to show up, and I find myself 
slipping, and all of a sudden she's there, being the person they need, saying the word, and it all makes me so incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> because I'm not sure if I am that person, if I want to be that person, and I just don't want to lose the Tracy Ching in my mind because the original Tracy Ching accepts jobs with gratitude and enthusiasm. And she formed a career running on nothing but hard work and no sleep. <laughs> and she sits in the quiet dark of night working on the next illustration that scares her. She remembers where she came from. And she would have never thought to end up here, to have so many people drag their butts out of bed early in the morning <laughs> to hear her discuss something as ludicrous as double-sided Tracy Chings. <laughs> <laughs> so as you begin your day, I hope you'll take some time to reflect on how success is asymmetrical. And your road to making it might take you places you did not think you were going to go. And the end of that road that success might not look the way you thought it would. When you're grappling with those inner demons, um, remember to cut yourself a little bit of slack. And when it comes to expectations for yourself or experiencing self-doubt, maybe give yourself a little more credit than you do. But if you've gleaned anything from this humble brag complaint session about my success, <laughs> I hope that it's you will more readily accept the good, kind, and beautiful perceptions others have of you, even if it makes you a little uncomfortable. Thank you.